what it is brad lee back again with another episode of dropping bombs today in the studio folks as always got a real treat for you my man cody grand adam in the house folks if you guys don't know cody grand adam he's he's a an old soul he's you might recognize him from zz top he used to sing in the in the zz top era remember that yeah yeah and then he went on to create duck dynasty he's also known as willie what's his name robertson willie robertson folks willie robertson in the house today folks take a screenshot right now and be like oh my god willie robertson's on dropping bombs but folks no cody grand adam he is an entrepreneur i would say an inventor yeah i would say i would say a uh a dad a husband a friend Cody Grand Adam. And where can they follow you on social media? Cody Grand Adam on and, Instagram. Though. And, and That's by, about it. Yeah. And by the way, Grand Adam is grand. And then Adam. One word though. Grand Adam. Cody Grand Adam. Where's that name from? I th- they tell me France. Really? But I'm not 100% Is that sure. where you got those shades? They Actually, look like a pair of Elton they, John specials. These are uh, Jimmy Choo's. These are, these are Jess's, my wife's. They've oh. got a little bit of a, what do they call that? A little rhinestone on the side. Are they prescription are, as well? Oh, I was going to say, because when you took them off, I saw a little bit of a lens flare. Yeah, prescription. So, I can, so I you, can see you and your too. wife have the same prescription? Yep. I'll be damned. It's pretty convenient. I would almost say bullshit. No. I would say you're blaming that they're your wives just because they look a little feminine. I mean, we can call her Brad. They, they look a little Elton Johnny. I, I like them. So, folks, Cody Grand Adam is an entrepreneur. He's got a company called Lights All. You may have seen his products all over the shelves of Walmart, Dollar General, Target, Kmart's. What else? Safeways. Menards. Big Menards. Lots. Big about, lots. About 100,000 different retailers. 100,000 different retailers. So, folks, you don't know the dude behind the products that you've seen, but I guarantee you, you've walked by aisles and supermarkets and grocery stores and freaking Costco's and Walmart's all over the United States. And you've seen this man's products on the shelf. You just didn't know it was this man's. And now next time you're looking, look around, tag him, take a picture of his products on the shelving and tag him to make sure the products displayed. Right. Dude, don't you ever worry that when you put your product in those stores, those stores, uh, employees may, you know, push them in the back or do you ever go out and make sure that they're presented correctly? I mean, if I'm in a store and they're 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 not presented well, I'll, you know, we'll straighten it up a little bit. But most stores are pretty good at that. Really, They've got their own teams and merchandisers and all okay. That so then, stuff. let me ask you this: How do you get on those shelves? I've heard a nasty little rumor that says you're buying space on those shelves. Some some stores you technically are buying the space because, you know, when you when you look at a store, there's a planogram and there's only there's so a much what? room. A planogram, right? So, you know, there's only so much room. So if they're going to put you in, they've got to take someone out. Well, most of these stores have paid for that product, that merchandise. So you're going to have to pay maybe a slotting fee or a fee to get that old product out of the store so you can get in. Um, so that happens a lot. But I mean, at the end of the day, most of the stores are just buying the product like you would anything else and putting it on the shelves. And they worry about what they're going to do with that other product. So let me ask you a question. Why are people picking yours as opposed to all these other flashlight companies and and you're not just a flashlight company but it's flashlight based meaning you've yeah. got other products but they're all lit up somehow <clears throat> yeah so when I, when I started the company's called Promere products so Premier. Origi- yes so originally it was going to be a product company but then I thought to myself when I look at the demographics of the different businesses that are selling flashlights there's not very many that are only selling flashlights they're selling flashlights knives gloves tools and everything else and so I really wanted to focus in one area of business and become the best at it. And so that's why I chose flashlights. Um, and, you know, that's what we've done since then. Now, we've evolved because once you, you're you in these big retailers and you're doing well in flashlights, they say, hey, how about work lights or lanterns and different lights like that? So that's why we've evolved into full-on portable lighting. And so how old were you when you started it? Um, 24, 25. How much money did you have in the bank? negative money you owed people yeah you had no money how was your credit though not great really you had shitty credit too yes and what and what like made you think hey i want to sell flashlights so previously i was uh 19 or 20 years old 
we just had my uh, my uh, first son Hayden, and uh, looking for a job. I got a job selling batteries. Out of the and, by, and by the way, when you say we, you and Jesse, yes. yeah, Jess, which and, is your wife, yep, which is a funny individual, all in and of herself. Yes, yeah, she is. And you guys been together since. 17 years old since 17 high school sweetheart still madly in love that's right. best friends that's right i watch them on social media if you watch them you don't see much of jess but when you do <laughs> you're like this is a cool chick yeah keep going so anyways 19 20, 19 or 20 years old needed a job had a had a son obviously like i said and uh someone was hiring for a marketing manager and you, dad, that, that almost sounds like lyrics to a song yeah 19 or 20 years old needed a job <laughs> yeah it does brad Keep going. <laughs> anyway so i needed a job this company was hiring a marketing manager it was like 60 grand a year i thought like wow that's a lot of money for me back then i applied and uh he said you're not qualified now you weren't bearded up no i was i was probably wearing a suit right i was trying to be presentable at that time and so he said but hey i've got this other company we're selling batteries brand new company um i can start you there and at the time, I was trying to sell insurance. I was doing all these different things. He said, hey, I'll pay you 200 bucks a week. You can just do it on your own time, drive around this minivan and sell batteries. And so I did that. And uh, in about a couple of months, opened up like 60 accounts, just knocking on doors, convenience doors. And I thought to myself, man, that, that was a lot of work to open up 60 doors. And my old man said, Cody, why don't you just call someone that owns 60 doors? right? You can sell that one person, they'll get it out to everybody. And I called a company in Iowa called Come and Go. And uh, 435 stores, got a meeting, the buyer bought for all 435 stores. And I think that's when my perspective changed instantly. I said, this is what I should be doing. Well, fast forward, I did that for that company for about four years. Things didn't work out. They actually let me go. And I said, there's not really much going on. I'm going to try to start my own flashlight company. And so the white flashlights. Oh yeah. Let's rewind, I guess. So as I was selling batteries, sorry, double A, triple A, C's, D's, nine volts, it's almost a race to the bottom. So there's like no innovation. So if I'm calling you, Hey, I've got this battery to, for sale. The buyers literally have to buy because they like you, right? Because they're the same as everybody else's. But once you sell to them, there's not other things you can sell with it. So for example, Brad, if I sell you a, a counter display for all 400 stores. I can't call you next month and be like, Hey, you want another counter display? Well, no, the first one didn't sell through yet. So I would ask the buyers like, Hey, what other products are you buying? And most of the battery buyers were buying flashlights too. And I knew flashlights are something that people buy multiple times and they can buy different ones. And so I said, Hey, I'm going to start buying flashlights. So at that company just really went online, found a flashlight supplier in China, started importing the flashlights and then our sales grew tremendously because now we had um a product that you could sell over and over again and you could also innovate right did you go around to those same accounts that you already established exactly so the sales grew grew exponentially um, and then when i left that company like i said i was like do i want to sell batteries or do i want to sell flashlights and i said i'm gonna i'm gonna really get involved with the flashlight sales and that's what we did and uh we got lucky i guess I don't know if you want to call it luck or not, but we got a really big account right off the front, uh, True Value, and uh, 4,000 stores, and uh, that kind of launched the business. Couldn't that hurt people that don't have enough money to fulfill the orders of 4,000 stores? I didn't, have the, I didn't have the money to fulfill the orders. So how did you do it? And so fortunately, I had developed a good relationship with the manufacturers in China in the previous four years. And you said, hey, I sold 4,000. I need them ahead of time. So I said, hey, can I get terms? So they gave me terms. So bought the product. Well, I, you're lucky they did. So they it's did. essentially a Chinese company financed you. Yes. To get started. Yep. And so, but that was only part of it because I, I had terms with them, but True Value also had terms with me. So they paid me 90 days after they received their goods. I had to pay China 60 days after I received my goods. Right. And so I re, let's say I received them on March 1st. I'm shipping to uh, True Value on April 1st. They're going to pay me 90 days later. Why would it take you a month to ship them? Because we got to get it in. We got to take it off the containers, repalletize it, put carton labels on it, set up routing, all that stuff. And so I'm paying China 30 days after that. They're not paying me for another 60. So that became a little bit of a problem. How would you get out that out? So we, uh, we factored our invoices. So I basically sold. Which means sold them, folks. It means he took the invoice, 
that was waiting to be paid in 60 days and he got the money ahead of time minus a little discount to someone who was smart enough to realize, well, shit, dude, they're going to pay their bill. So I'm just going to give them a little money in advance. That's factoring. Yeah. And back then it's probably, it's probably similar to today. It was, it was 18% interest a year, Damn. which sounds crazy, but we're only factoring for 60 days. So they took 3% interest. So I think the order was like 180 grand. We paid them their 3%. And what I did was I think my cost on that 180 grand was like maybe 90,000. But I spent the entire amount that I would have profited in product. So I, I was able to fulfill that true value order. And then I had enough units in my warehouse that I could get more customers. And that's what we did to start the business. Um, our second customer was Menards, which is a large retailer in the Midwest. And um, th both of those true value and Menards are still some of our best customers today. And now if I just invented a product that you thought was cool, would you just go to Menards and show it to them? I could. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. See, that's why I told you, dude, what you need to do is start a militia. You need to start having people that are interested in getting their shit on the shelf. They get a hold of you and boom, you're in business. In fact, when this episode drops, your Instagram will blow up. And you will start getting DMs and people reaching out saying, hey, I have products that I need on the shelf. And then you can help them get it on the shelf. Well, and by the way, I'm in on that business because that's a business, my friend. Yeah, it's interesting because we, we've already done that in a sense. Ah, hogwash. Not, I would say in a sense, Brad. And so like my other companies that we've started, right? We, I have other product-based companies. Like Acubo. Acubo, for example. So Acubo, Matt Pell, my partner in that business, we, we've sold that business actually. You um, had an exit? Yeah, about two months ago. Mm, what kind of exit was that? It was, it was a nice exit. It was was good. it a seven-figure exit? It was. You made a seven-figure exit? Yes. Congrats. Is that Thank your you. first exit? Um, yes, it would be. See, I haven't exited a company either. And I'm yeah. old. It's like, dude, that's one of my goals here pretty quick in the next three to five to, to exit. I, I think in business, like what we're doing, that's when you that's when you really make the money is at the exit. Obvious. Right? Like, you know, even in the flashlight company, we're doing great revenue, but it's not producing tremendous income for me. Yeah, margins are small. Yeah. Especially so. in, in the flashlight biz. Yeah, it is. And so back with Matt. So Matt came to me. I think he was probably 26 years old passionate for the outdoors, invented this product, had a prototype made, but had no idea how to manufacture. He was a full-time engineer. And uh, basically we partnered with Matt and uh, we got that product manufactured, started selling it. You know, today it's in probably every sporting goods store in the United States, sells really well on Amazon, really well online. And we did that exact same thing. We took that concept and we did develop the entire package all the way to the consumer basically. And we've done that two or three different times. Now, what's now. that cost to put a person? It depends. Um, what does that cost you? I, it, it depends, but you it, can get it. Can it you can get it done cheaper than I can. Hundred percent. Yeah. Why so? Because the big thing with me is, you know, all the things I've done, I've had to do through just trying and doing it. Well, when you do those things, you make a lot of mistakes, and you know, mistakes are very expensive. I try to only make a mistake once. And so I always tell people, everything seems really simple, like selling into retail, which I thought that too, 13 years ago, but there's so many things you have to pay attention to. And so now that we've made those mistakes, the people that we partner with or the potential people we partner with, we can avoid a lot of those mistakes. So that's one way to save tremendous cost. Uh, secondly, we're manufacturing so much product in China as it is. And so our, uh, I guess our partners, you'd call them, they know our volume is great. And so... You know, a lot of times when you get a price, if you want to buy those glasses on your table, hey, I need a price for a hundred, maybe it's four bucks. And they say, okay, what's the price for a thousand? That's three seventy-five. What's the price for ten thousand? That's three bucks. We usually go right in from the beginning, and I'm going to get that best price because they they know our history and what what we can do with moving inventory and retail. And so I think that's another way that they're going to save a tremendous amount of money. But really, it comes down to not knowing things is very costly. Yeah, but see, folks, he's not just a flashlight guy. You live out in Peru, Illinois. My business is in Peru. I live in Hennepin. Hennepin. But yeah. still, you, you live out. And by the way, like your house, you bought it. Now there's a big lake, and it's looking all beautiful and, and resort-like. But you built that to yeah. look, look that way. And then you'd buy old buildings in, in, in town, and you'd turn them into things. Mm -hmm. And now they're becoming these rejuvenated properties that people are frequenting and thriving in one of which I, I don't, I can only picture is that 
building where fire on fifth is yeah what's that building called it's the, the west clocks building yeah you bought the west clocks building it was all burnt down or what was it so the west clocks building used to be a, a huge clock factory five thousand employees and we're in a town of ten thousand so that's a lot and uh they were in business for 100 years it closed up in the 1980s it was multiple buildings but about a million square feet total and it, it's pretty much that boarded up ever since ever since i could remember and uh so we bought the building about 10 years ago and uh, it's been our goal to really rejuvenate it and just create it to be a place where, you know, dozens of different businesses are in there and hundreds of people are coming back into it rather than having something that. So is, you're just opening little businesses. Yeah. Renting spaces out, opening and stuff yourself. Is that Cigar Lounge there? Now, yeah, I'm waiting for you to come, Brad. I was going to say, dude, I don't, well, I don't know if it'll thrive or not, but Fire on Fifth is a pizza restaurant that looks like it has amazing food. Yeah, Fire on Fifth's doing great. You know, it's, 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 it's cool because, like I said, this building everybody knows about. And so it's cool to come back in there because the last time anybody was in that building in this capacity was in the 80s. But you can imagine having 5,000 people in our town of 10,000 working there. So everybody has an aunt, an uncle, brother, sister. So just them coming back, they walk in there like, holy cow. What else did you put in there? Uh, we've got the fire on fifth. We've got a uh, full full distillery making, you know, whiskeys, vodkas, brandies, rums. We've got day spas, martial arts studios, um, tattoo studio, um, manufacturing So it's like a mall. Pretty much. So if you go out to uh, Franklin, Tennessee, because as you know, I got a little spot in Brentwood, which oh, yeah. is near Franklin. You go out to Franklin, there's a there's a thing out there called, um, uh, what the hell is it called? But it's basically an old factory. We went there. I went there with you. Oh, you did? Yeah. So that old factory is very similar to the West Clocks? Yeah. Yeah. So like, dude, that's cool. Because I mean, you got the old coolness of it, but then you got the new modernness of it. This one in Franklin's getting yeah. really cool. Like there are good restaurants coming in there, bars in the middle, you know, donut shop, coffee shop, little, little knickknack store, art store, flower store, jewelry store, event center, you know, farmers mm -hmm. markets on the weekend. Like, are you doing all that? Yeah. So, you know, the, the cool thing about it is most cities today have an old building like that. And most people don't look at it with the vision of what it could be. And so they're pretty cheap to buy. And so that, that's been a goal of mine too, eventually, is to find old buildings like that and do that same exact thing. So you, you said an event center. We just opened up an event center this year. Um, me and Mike, he, he's my uh, CEO for the Flashlight Company. And uh, it's in an 8,000 square foot, built 8,000 square foot of the building, completely raw, concrete floors, right? Steel beams, you would think it'd be used for a warehouse. We opened up an event center. We have, we have 24 weddings booked for this year, right? That That's like a cash flow dream. You don't you don't really need to em employ people. You just have the space there. You throw a big party. You clean it up afterwards, and you can do that over and over again. But if you think about it, like I said, all cities have buildings like that. And so I think that's a huge opportunity, too, to get in some of these old buildings and then do exactly what we did in Peru, Illinois, but in cities all over the place, mm. like maybe Nashville, Brad. Yeah, see, so that's what I mean by like the dude's an entrepreneur from the from the word go. You're not just a dude who built a flashlight company up to, you know, eight, nine figures. You're building all kinds of little companies. You're buying real estate. You're investing in real estate. You own a lot of property, apartments, old buildings. You know what I mean? You're becoming a legend in the town of Peru. I would imagine you're well known there, no? I mean, I think everybody, yeah, a lot of people know me just because it's such a small town, you know, and, you know. Yeah, but I'm, are you liked? Does everybody like, oh, I love oh, Cody, good guy. I, I think I think so. I don't think I have too many enemies in town. I, I try to be, uh, I, I'm have pretty you ever much been the in same a fight? everywhere. To be honest, I've never been in a fight. In town? No. Ever? I've never been in a fight, period. You've never I've, been in a fight? I've never even been punched in the face. Come on. No, seriously. Ever? Never. See, that's the problem with today's youth, I think. Yeah, maybe. Well, again, like, it's not just punched in the face, but, you know, per se, it's like spanked. Yeah. Punched in the face. Um, in other words, like, I have respect for people automatically because I realized that I could get my teeth kicked in. I could get punched. I could get shot. I could get, you know, when I was a kid, I got spanked by a belt and it didn't ruin me. It taught me that yeah. freaking I better listen and follow rules. Okay. It gave me some sort of structure and fear of consequence. Nowadays, I don't think anyone has a fear of any consequence, especially online. Like you can sit there and talk shit online. 
Oh yeah. And think that there's no way in hell anyone's ever going to figure out who you are, but in reality, they can figure out who you are. There's just never really a consequence. Sure. And that's why you got a lot of keyboard warriors. Yeah. Or it's because most people have never been punched in the face. I mean, so I've been punched in the face. Is it hurt? Not really. Not really? not really as much as you think it would. Like if you wanted to hit me in the face, I would fear this massive bash against the freaking cheek and knocking out teeth and you know all of this pain and suffering when in reality if you actually did it, it's 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 like a little bit jarring and it feels like almost numb immediately. Brad, why would I don't feel like anyone would want to punch you in the face? I know, but you see what I'm saying? Like it, it's not it's not as scary as everyone thinks. Yeah. Now, can it be? Yeah, you get a gash on your face that needs stitches. You can break your nose sideways. You can knock out teeth. But in reality, most people, when they get hit in the mouth, it's just jarring. It's just alarming. It doesn't really hurt per se. So everyone's afraid of it when in reality, it's like a bee sting. You ever been stung by a bee? Of course. Do people freak out when a bee comes around and the little sting does not hurt that much. Sure. But you think it's going to hurt you dramatically. And it's not necessarily the sting that bothers me. It's the itch mm -hmm. for the next two weeks. But anyway, back to the story. So you built all these businesses, but it all stemmed from the one business. That's right. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So all these entrepreneurs out there that want to get their shit on the shelf. That's what you should call that, by the way. Shit on the shelf. Sure. Inc. SOS. And I'm 50-50 partners with you. Anybody from the bomb squad reaches out that you guys go make millions together, just cut a brother in. Uh, what do they call that? A tad for Brad? Yeah. Just cut a brother in, dude. It's because of this show that you're getting the exposure that could lead to millions of dollars. So just pay a brother his due. I'm exposing the world because there's a lot of listeners out there, dude. They've probably got products they're trying mm -hmm. to get on shelves and can't reach out to you, yeah. you know, pass whatever tests or questions you've got. Dude, you can pick up the phone and get them into Menards, get them into Dollar General, get them into Walmarts. You can teach people how to do exactly what you did. Yeah, I think, I mean, we could definitely show the way that we did it. Obviously, not everybody is guaranteed. Yeah, but dude, you could places. also do it for them. You can help them with manufacturing. You can help mm -hmm. them with packaging. You can help them with getting their products trademarked. You're, you can help them with, you know, getting the product on the shelf. You can probably help them with funding and financing in case they can't afford to do stuff like this. Like, dude, you're the retail guy. Mm -hmm. So, folks, if you guys are interested in figuring out how to get on shelves, or you have a product that you want on a shelf, DM Cody Grand Adam, flood his Instagram and, 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 and have a conversation. Cause again, he's not, this isn't an offer he makes. He's, he's not out in the world doing this for people. I'm just recognizing that he could. And I think you should. And when all of those people come to you, obviously you're going to charge something. You're going to, you know, make it worth your while, but you're also going to, you know, fuel their dream, yeah. get them on the shelves, just like someone did for you at some point. Because yeah. Menards or someone had to say yes. Then you had to be smart enough to get the, the Chinese company to say, okay, basically I'll front them to you because that's what you did. Yep. And then you had to find someone that factored, which isn't too difficult. But I mean, someone had to kind of show you the way. And even though you learned most of it yourself, now you're able to say, oh, you, you've got a product or service. You're like I used to be. Let me help you. And that to me is the best coach out there. Why? Because what you're trying to do as a coach or a mentor is to get others to where you be, to where you are. So if, if, if you're looking for a coach or a mentor and you reach out to someone who's never done what you're trying to do, you're foolish. But if, if your thing is, Hey, I want to get on the shelf. I need to sell my product in, in all the stores in the world. Is that called retail? Yeah. Yeah. I want to be in retail. That's the retail bandit. I'll, I'll, I'll take that. You got to come up with a name yeah. shit on the shelf. Yeah. Yeah. You want to get shit on the shelf? Cody grand Adam. He'll get shit on your shelf. He'll I get like shit that. on the shelf quick. I like, you know, and, and also you got to think about like if, if, you know, I'm on Instagram all the time and there's people out there, you can sell anything. Right. But if you think about like, there's a lot of people selling fitness things, right. And getting in shape and all that good stuff. Not everybody wants to, I think everybody would like to look good, but not everyone obviously wants to be in shape enough right because well, everybody wants to they, they just don't want to pay the price yeah exactly and so but i think if you took people and you, you you polled them and you said hey do you have an idea for something right everybody's got an idea 
of some sort. I know you probably got a dozen of them, Brad. You know I like, do. Like you just go around and you just look around and you say, "I wish there was, I wish this was better. Or there was a better way of doing this." Every, I would say ninety per, ninety people out of a hundred have that. Well, I, I call that a concept, right, or an idea. You know, that's something that most people will never capitalize on. It's like first, where do you start, and then where do you take it from there? And I think that's what we become pretty good so at. So, do you too. want people to submit concepts to you? Well, I, I think that everyone. I think that everyone, as you said. Everyone has a dream, right? But they don't have the vehicle to get them to that point. But I think everybody has a good idea. Maybe not a good idea, but an idea. And so it's it's how to take that concept and, and actual uh, con- conceptualize it, right? And I think that's what we become really good at too, is taking something that even like our flashlight business, a lot of the flashlights that we create are ones that I, I literally drew on Microsoft Paint. Right. And then we take that idea all the way to the end product. There's a lot of steps involved. And so you mentioned earlier about mentors. I think that was my, that's why it took me so long to do what I'm doing today is because I didn't know anybody. Right. There's no, I don't, I don't know a lot of people online that are taking ideas and developing products and doing the whole thing and then putting them in retail stores and training on that or teaching on that. What do you, what do you think the best invention in the flashlight industry has been? Um, I mean, I think obviously the LED, right? Before the LED, you had regular vacuum bulbs and different types of bulbs. I would argue that. Okay. What do you think? I mean, in reality, I think the most innovative, a tad bizarre, but innovative invention in the flashlight business in the last hundred years must have been the fleshlight. I knew you were going to go there. Well, again, I mean, like the fleshlight, someone looked at a, someone looked at a, at a light, at a, at a, flashlight and said man imagine if i put a a, a moist <laughs> hole in that thing which I, I don't understand where the batteries go because if that's where your shit's supposed to go like how, how, where's the batteries because if, when i look at a flashlight dude and the handle's usually where the batteries are but that's where the the poker is or the sure. the moistness then where's the batteries right right behind the the led driver you can put it, you can get a rechargeable battery that would fit in the first two inches of that. Dude, listen, you don't need batteries. <laughs> oh yeah. Here we go. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. It's a shake. It's like the, it's like the, you uh, don't, the shake you don't need batteries. The, the flashlight doesn't need to work. <laughs> there we go. Let's take it it's to the market. It's a flashlight. It was a freaking secret jack off device. But what if you, you could, could look in someone's glove box and see a flashlight and not question it? In reality, it's a pocket pussy. But Brad, what if it's, we made and by it- the way, for people that don't know what a flashlight <laughs> is, someone took a flashlight and, and 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 took out the batteries and stuck someplace where you stick your dick, your dick, your what dick. If the, <laughs> what if we made it to where it did work, and the the motion of which generated the electricity and the battery stored it. And it actually lit up too. Oh, you know, convenient. You know what I'm saying? But again, when would you use a flashlight when you're using it for the fleshlight? You'd no, probably you, just want to turn it on to see what. No, who's you watching would, you. You would charge it while using the flashlight, and then if there's ever an emergency, you've got battery power in there. Right. Well, anyway, but I would hats say off I, to the person who invented the fleshlight. I wonder how much money they made. I would say that's an innovation, though, not in in flashlights. That'd be an innovation in. Sex toys. They could also, which I've never seen a, 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 a f- dildo version of it, meaning imagine a, f- a fleshlight, you unscrew it and there's the hole. Yeah. Well, imagine a flashlight and you just unscrew the whole handle and you pull it off and there's a ding dong. We could make it both. Call it the bone light. Yeah, we could do that, Brad. Or call it the dill light. We probably won't put that in, in the lights all brand though. The dildo light. Yeah, that it's something we could we could do. We you could be our first you could be the the first uh or it'd just be a flashlight for her. Yeah. Anyway, and and by the way, people would say, "Well, why would they have to take off the handle?" Well, it's, it, you want why it to be you just shape it. Oh yeah, that's the discretion part. Right? Indeed. Anyway, let's get our minds out of the gutter. Your mind, Brad. Your mind went there. So, dude, you you invent shit. What's some things you've invented? I mean, mostly, mostly in the flashlight category. I think we've got um, almost fifty patents now. So, um, just, just in the, that's a th- that's a thing too. There, I think there's very few like new inventions 
they're all spins on other things that were already out there, but just, you're just making it better. Mm. So that's what we really do when it comes to flashlights. We're just innovating something that was already out there. Now you're, you're, you, you're generally successful seemingly in all your endeavors. Have you failed at any? For sure. How many? Um, a couple. What's your most aggravating failure? Um, I mean, so during when COVID happened, we made a product that uh, we thought was going to do really well. So in our restaurant, Fire on Fifth, we have a beer wall. And so you come in, you give us your credit card. We'd, we'd open a tab. We'd give you a card back. You can pour your own beer all night, right? Well, each one of those beers, they have a tapper on there. So we created a little sleeve that goes over the tap system. So you just pull a sleeve off. Kind of like a condom. Exactly. And uh, we call the Tapkins. And uh, we, we invested in that company. We had a we, we thought we had a huge order from a really large retailer, 10,000 stores. So we opened up the molds. We got everything going. And by the time we got to the point where we were ready to sell it, everybody was like, what's this COVID stuff? You know, we don't, we don't need to worry about that anymore. So we, we put in a little bit of money. And um, at the end of the day, it wasn't something that the market wanted any longer. What's another one? Uh, we started a, a salsa biz, a, a tortilla chip company. Um, started a tortilla chip company, bought all the stuff. What um, was it called? Well, we had a couple of names. I, I, I'd rather not say the name of the tortilla chip company <laughs> Why? because uh, we, we went our separate ways. Oh, but, uh, we started that now I'm going to be relaunching that obviously, but the partner that I, that I was going to partner with turned out to be not a guy I wanted to partner with. So we went, we went our separate ways. And so now I've got a, I got a full on tortilla chip manufacturing facility in my building. Just kind of sitting there. Do they make dust. the best damn tortilla chips on this planet? No, they didn't. Are you selling <laughs> tortillas in quesadillas? We'd like to. We'd like to. Dude, the food on the the stories I see at Fire on Fifth, it all looks like gourmet pizza or just like really kick ass food. Where'd you find the person that comes in with all those recipes? So that's interesting. We, we came out to Vegas. I said, hey, I want to start a pizza business in my building. And it wasn't really, obviously, it's great to make some money, but it was, hey, it's it's my building. It'll bring people in. So I went to Vegas to a pizza pizza um, convention. And I just met vendors out here. We met a gentleman, actually a team of guys that, that built the oven. And I said, hey, this is a beautiful oven. They're talking about how it works, blah, blah, blah. And I'm thinking to myself, well, I don't know how to make these gourmet pizzas. They, they taste great in your oven. They said, well, Actually, we actually have a school in New York. So you pay us a little money, you come out, we teach you the, how to make the pizzas, all the stuff that goes with it, and then now we, we help you start your business. So that's what we did. I, look, I went out and found a, found a GM that uh, ran some bit, uh, restaurants in the past, sent him to pizza school, and uh, learned everything in a week, came back, and we just put a little bit of a spin on it. And, it, and you had to pay that guy, I'm sure. For sure. What, what, what did you invest into Fire on 5th before it started? I'd say fire on fifth. We probably have maybe three quarters of a million. So between the build out and before you got a dollar one. Yeah, for sure. See, that's risky. What if nobody wanted pizza? That'd be a problem, but everyone loves pizza. I know, but in a small town like that, how many pizzas do you got to sell to get back to 150 K 750 K. Three quarters of a million. Oh, three quarters. I thought you said a quarter. Yeah, three quarters of a million. So you put up seven fifty, hoping people would want pizza. I mean, you obviously know they're going to sell some, but the question is, is how how long does it take you to get your money back? Yeah, and you you never really know. But like you know, that's have I, you got your money back yet? Not yet. It'll take a few years to recoup that entire investment. But I mean, I, for me, like I said, it's we want to make money. We will. It's, it's, it's going to be a good financial investment, but, but for me, it was more, Hey, it's in our building, right? It's cool. I can walk down there and, you know, have lunch during the day. But again, it brings people into the building and, and that fire on fit, the pizza restaurant is going to help us expand other parts of that building too. Right. And so it started with the distillery. Is it on fifth street? Yeah. Well, there's the problem though. Cause if you want to, you know, franchise it sure. out and make it all over the world everyone has got to put it on fifth street no so what, what our concept so that that's the part, second part of our concept as well is creating franchises and so earlier i talked about buying an old building and putting businesses in there so let's say we, we bought a building on in nashville right on broadway well first we have to come up with like probably 10 million bucks but it would just be fire on broadway right or fire on maine and so the fire on fifth came about is because 
I think earlier you. So missed. it's fire on whatever street you're whatever on. Whatever street. Fire on Burnside. That's right. Fire on uh, Southern Highlands. Yeah. So something I didn't say earlier. The building that we're in. Fire on Las this. Vegas Boulevard. You could do that. Half of the building burnt down 14 years ago. Two kids were playing, lit a boat on fire. That spread half the building. What if, burnt what down. if it's fire on Leaperwitz Circle? You can call it whatever you want. That, that might be a little long, but it still works. It works. Yeah. Fire on is the brand. Yeah, and so, but the reason how we came up with that, which I think, whenever you're doing Fran, like if you think of everything, a lot of things that are successful, there's a story behind it, right? People like to tell stories. So why do we come up with fire on fifth? You would think it's because it's it's fire roasted brick oven, fire on fifth, or you think because people say all oh, that food's fire, but. 14, 15 years ago, we had a huge fire in our building, probably one of the biggest fires in our area. Twenty it took it took a week to burn out, two million gallons of water. But over the intercom, everybody said, "Hey, there's a fire on Fifth. There's a fire on Fifth." So in our area, they just knew that to be the big fire on Fifth, and so that's the story we tell locally. And if we were ever looking to expand in other areas, that would be like the history, the the, the about us, if you will, the story that would resonate. Now, obviously, it was in Nashville. They're probably not going to care about a fire in Pru, Illinois, but still helps to sell that story a little bit. Is selling a story important? I think I think it's incredibly important. I think when I I think that's one of my I think that's one of my secret sauces when I'm working with these major retailers, right? I think I what's think, your story to them? I think it's just a story of a guy that you know didn't have a whole lot going for him at one point and was down and had his back against the wall and just decided to take a leap of faith. And really at the time it wasn't a leap of faith because what, what did I have to lose, right? But uh, anyways, I decided to do something for myself and work hard and built this business. And I did it without, um, you know, I guess knowing what I was doing, but just kept at it. And today when I'm meeting with these big buyers, you know, they look at me as, you know, the flashlight guy, right? Like that's that's what I'm known as in my industry. But now that our company is doing better, we look like this national brand, so to speak, but I'm just a regular guy, right? And I think that resonates with a lot of the people that I work with because- well, Where'd Lights All come from? So Lights All came from, actually that- Hey, people are going to get mad because I cut you off right when you were about to give the answer. So go back to that. Well, now I forgot what I was even talking oh, about, Brad. Well, then what's Lights All come from? Um, so Lights All, so this is, a, this is a really good, I guess, tip for everybody. Like I said, when I started my company, I, and I have no like college degree, no no education other than high school. Obviously, yeah. So when I started my comp company, I trademarked Promier, P R O M I E R, and the reason why I came up with that name was because everything was taken, and so I just took two words, Premier, and then promotional. So when I started, we we were doing promotional sales. So like that sale to true value, that was a one time sale. They sell it out. We sell them something new. I trademarked that in the United States. I failed to trademark that in China. And so actually one of my suppliers that I was buying from saw that we were growing. They trademarked my name in China. And so I was now unable to bring in my own brand out of China. They could seize all my containers. And so I'm like, what am I going to do now? We spent a couple hundred thousand dollars trying to get our name back. And I figured out like it's it's if it does happen, it's going to cost us a lot more money. So I was actually in a Home Depot and I was buying some stuff from my house and at the register right past where they saw all the saws and all that Milwaukee had a little marker and it was called ink saw I N K Z A L L. And I'm like, man, that'd be cool. Light saw. And I stuck with us. We trademarked it. I trademarked it in China this time and all, really all over the world. And that's what we ran with. And now it's, it's, it's synonymous in the lighting industry. Mm. Folks, see, anything's possible. No money, regular dude, middle of nowhere, now owns half the town, <laughs> multiple successful businesses, and runs around all tatted up with a ZZ Top beard. And Elton Glenn, women's sunglasses. El yeah, Elton John glasses. What do you think about that, Brad? I see your kid in a lot of your stories lately. Like, are you starting to bring him into the business? Yeah, so Hayden graduated high school a um, month and a half ago, two months ago. And uh, I don't, you know, he did, college isn't really something he wanted to pursue. And so I thought to myself, I think the best education he can get is just sitting right behind me. So that's what he does all day pretty much. His chair is just right Where's behind he at right mine. Now? He's, he's with Jess somewhere uh -huh. in, on the strip. 
folks, go follow Cody at Cody Grand Adam on Instagram. We're going to have you back for another episode, friend. All right. And, and, and dude, seriously, like you're going to get a lot of DMs from people wanting to talk a little bit more about this retailing opportunity. I think you and I need to hone that down to where we can literally start a brand new business or you that I just participate in <laughs> where people can come to you and either come to you with a concept that you help them bring to the shelf, you know, concept mm -hmm. to shelf, some sort of clever word that means concept that to consumer concept to consumer. Okay. Um, or a product that they're just having a hard time, you know, knowing the right people and getting mm -hmm. it on the right shelves, knowing the right buyers. Like you could literally just help them with a list of buyers that they could go. Cause if you get in the right place, dude, you can put your product on the shelf, but you don't know the buyer. You don't know the person. Here, here's what I tell people too. And you've seen this all the time. You, you've said this on your own Instagram, but you, you, you want to make a million dollars. You sell a, a dollar product to a million people, $10 product to a hundred thousand people and so forth. And then you have people that are selling millions of dollars in e-commerce. Well, if you want to sell a million units on e-commerce, same thing. You probably got to sell it to a, a million people. But when you think about retail, if I want to sell a million units, I can sell it to one buyer at Dollar General, 20,000 stores, right? That's five units per store. And so even people that are successful, on 20,000, five, five units per store. That'd be 100,000 units. Yeah, you're right, 50 units. See, you don't have to be smart either. So my point is there's a lot of people selling tremendous products, great items online, and it, it works really well. But those same individuals would probably be super successful selling into retail. But it's a different ballgame. You have to develop packaging, all those things, which is daunting, but that's something that it's easy for us to do. Well, if I'm selling out online, why would I ever need them on a shelf? Because I just told you why. Why? Because you can sell to one buyer. That's going to sell I know, hundreds but I, of thousands. But if I put it online and it sells a million of them, I don't care that well, I'll you do would. Is put it online. But that's like you, you had said one time, would you rather have a Ferrari or a Lamborghini? It's both. Both. So if you're selling 100,000 online, let's sell 100,000 in the stores too. But but again, the, 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 the net margins probably change when you're putting it on a shelf. It is, but I think if you develop it correctly, it doesn't have to. Because when you're selling online, you're buying ads, you're shipping that to the customer, right? You're always worried about your ROAS. When you're selling in retail, you bring it into your fulfillment center. You're shipping it in a full truckload. So a whole truckload of product one time, which costs probably 1500 bucks, And then that retailer is putting it out there. They're spending all the marketing dollars. So yeah, your 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 gross margin is less, but you don't have all those other things to worry about. There are things you need to worry about, like markdowns, allowances, you know, and the shipping and so forth. But at the end of the day, I think both industries, whether e-commerce or retail, there's costs involved. So at the end of the day, I think the margins are going to be pretty similar when it comes down to the net. Now, folks, when you go look him up, you're going to be like, well, he don't have millions of followers. No. Yet. Yet. Yeah, yeah. But again, because dude, you're out there like, you know, running businesses. You're not you're not coaching people and mentoring people and this isn't a business of yours, although it should be. Why? Because dude, you got the groundwork. You got the freaking connections. If I came up with a kick ass new product and said, Man, and, and I could literally fail by going out in there and trying to re invent the 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 actions that you took. Why? For whatever reason, I could just go to you and say, dude, can you help me get that on the shelf? You make one phone call, boom, in Menards. In fact, you did it with the with the tentacle thing, didn't you? Yeah, so tentacle is another item that's that's really cool. Actually, I've, I've got one here. Um, Hans went on Shark Tank, got a deal with Damon John. Um, Damon and I are, are good friends. And I, I told Damon, hey, I love that product. I don't want to participate in that company. So we, we're working together. And, um, you know, that's what we're doing with tentacle. Tentacle kills it online tons of sales online so um, but you also got it on the shelves yeah we got it on some shelves too and we're, that's what we're working on now as well as getting that maintaining that online business but getting it into retail too and um the great thing about retail is you know whenever you start a company you, you want to grow right especially if you want to sell that company growth is really important e-commerce is i guess it's pretty easy to grow because you, you can just scale up what you're doing but sometimes when you scale up what you did previously doesn't always transfer. Well, in retail, if I get, say, any product in a 100-store chain and it does 100000 in sales, well, 
a thousand stores is probably going to 10 X that it's pretty easy to tell that trajectory. And so for someone that is interested in starting a product based business and selling it, I think retail is the best way and the fastest way to get tremendous growth. And uh, you can do that. Like I said, just by opening up more stores, well, you don't have to physically open them, but getting them into more doors. And would you mind if the bomb squad reached out to you? Of course not. Hit you in the DMS. Yeah. You're going to get a billion questions. We're gonna have to we're gonna have to create something, Brad, so I can I can uh, answer all those. But questions. within those questions, dude, are opportunities for sure. There's gonna be somebody that says, "Hey, I got this, this, this." And you might go, "Holy shit, dude, that's a great idea. That's a great concept." Boom! Next thing you know, you guys are making millions together. Yeah. How do I fit in? I'm gonna leave that to you, brother. But I'll just make sure because you have integrity, right? Of course. Any deals that you get from the bomb squad include me. I'm an automatic participant because of the avenue from which it came. Bomb squad, you're welcome. Till next time, keep it real.